I'm Dave Wyman uh, of Abadata. Uh, Abadata is 43 years old, as uh, many of you know. Um, also uh, with me today is uh, uh, Lindy Weinman and Hi, everybody. Pam. Yeah. Hi. And and Pam, they they are our our media people, and Jeff Herman, who uh, is uh, our sales uh, uh, engineer. Um, today we have uh, a little bit of departure uh, with. Uh, Abadata, uh, defending data with Abadata. Uh, we have uh, Jason uh, McNew. Now, Jason uh, is not an Abadata employee, but he is, uh, he's been 25 years of experience in the field of information technology. Uh, he included 12 years of experience at the White House Communications Agency in Camp David, where he worked with some of the most secure systems in the world. And it's one of the big reasons that we invited Jason today is that he's got so much knowledge and so uh, so much to contribute uh, in the area of cybersecurity. Uh, Jason is a United States Air Force veteran. Thank you, Jason. And uh, he holds a master's degree from Penn State uh, in information si sciences, uh, cybersecurity, and information assurance. Um, he's got many other degrees, uh, bachelor of science, two associates degrees. Um, he is a CISSP. Now that's one of the coveted things that many of us security people really uh, look to become. Uh, CISSP, of course, is a certified uh, information system security professional. It's one of the top, uh, top uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, credentials that you can hold. In uh, 2020, uh, uh, Strong's Hold Security, uh, which was the company that uh, uh, Jason founded, it was acquired by Appalachia Technologies. And uh, Jason then served as a senior engineer of cybersecurity compliance and risk. Uh, in 2022, Jason joined the ConnectWise Global uh, Security Sales Team as a principal solutions advisor. Now, the neatest thing I think about Jason's profile here, uh, or bio, is that uh, uh, is the next part? Is that Jason lives with his four children near Gettysburg, uh, Pennsylvania, in a hewn log home that was built in 1760. And Jason's just been telling us uh, as we've been waiting for people to filter in uh, about his log home, and it, it truly sounds uh, amazing. So his hobbies include uh, home renovations, obviously, if you had a home from 1760, and of course the history, uh, uh, automobiles, and gardening. And with that, I'm going to turn over the webinar to Jason McNew. Okay. Thanks, Dave. That was the most comprehensive introduction I've ever had, bar none. Um, <laughs> so I won't spend any more time on that. <clears throat> I'm going to dive right in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so let's see. Uh, 1998, don't get into strangers' cars. Don't meet people from the internet. 2017, literally summon strangers from the internet to get into their cars. This is funny, of course. And I'm referring to uh, ride-sharing apps like Uber and Lyft. And the reason why I point this out is not only has technology changed radically in the last 20 years, uh, 25 years, but um, our culture has changed as well, too, right? Um, attitudes towards uh, privacy and security are different between different generations, whether it's uh, boomers or Generation X, uh, millennials, um, as, as we call them here in the United States. I don't know if you use the same terminology in, in Canada. I apologize. Uh, but anyways, different generations have different attitudes towards privacy and security. And when we're talking about cybersecurity, uh, that's something that we have to take into uh, uh, account, attitudes, depending on who your stakeholders are, who your uh, customers are, your employees, your vendors, so on and so forth. Um, so here, here's our agenda. We're going to talk about what cybersecurity is. We're going to talk about the history of cyber warfare a little bit, uh, some of the security concerns for small to mid-sized businesses, SEMA and MDR, and then we will finish up with uh, how important security and risk assessments are, which is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Um, so what is cybersecurity? I'm going to, this is a can definition. I'm going to read this. Cybersecurity is the practice of deploying people, policies, processes, and technologies to protect organizations, uh, their critical systems, and sensitive information from digital attacks. Now, if you take a certification or if you're in college, you might be asked to memorize something like that, and that's all well and good. But uh, cybersecurity is the business of managing risk in, in a scientific and measurable way. Uh, and for most businesses, small businesses in particular, security is going to be a cost center. This is not a profit center. Uh, it's like safety. You know, I mean, everybody has to do safety, and there's a lot of a lot of other things we have to do that are ancillary to whatever our business is. 
Um, so cybersecurity only makes sense to the extent that it uh, only makes sense to the extent that it reduces business risk or saves us money in ways that we can measure quantitatively or qualitatively. We have to be able to measure it; otherwise, we're just um, you know throwing stuff against the wall, so to speak. So internet distribution, uh, internet users in the world, uh, distribution, internet users distribution in the world, 2021. People, uh, sometimes I'll poll audiences when I do this live, and people are always surprised to find that less than 7% of the world's internet users are actually in North America. Most of them are outside of North America. Uh, if you look at the biggest piece of the pie here is Asia, Europe, Africa, and in spite of uh, the fact that only 7% of the world's internet users are in North America, 90, 90, uh, almost 94% of the attacks are on, are on uh, Americans, on North, on North America, Americans and Canadians, frankly, I mean, really the Western world. And there's, uh, there's, there's reasons for this, and I'll get into that in a second. Uh, and who are these bad actors? There are some solo hackers. As far as the small the sm SMBs go, the small to mid-sized businesses, it, it's overwhelmingly over organized crime, and it's just plain old robbery. It's like robbing a stagecoach or robbing a train, and the target selection is completely indiscriminate. And there's basically two criteria that they uh, that they use for choosing their their targets: is do they think you have money? Does it look like you have money? And do they think they could steal it? That's it. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't. You could be doing the angels' work or the devil's work or whatever. They don't care. They're just they're just robbing you. And it's, um, I've made this analogy many times, but it's a lot like a blue whale swimming through the ocean, just eating krill. They're just vacuuming up krill. They just swim around and eat the krill. And then once something, they spit it out and you're the krill. Uh, so it's completely indiscriminate. Most of it's organized crimes come from overseas. Some nation states, uh, this is the really scary stuff. And we've seen some major hacks. And when I worked for the White House, uh, we had an incident where, uh, well, I can't get into that too much, but there was an incident where uh, Rush had gotten to the executive office of the president's systems, and it was just like a disaster. Uh, and then recently, there was a hack of solar winds. You remember, remember that? That was a, a fantastic, catastrophic attack. So, uh, but again, most of the threats facing the SMBs and your listeners are going to be organized crime that are just trying to rob you. So remember this, this was the Soviet Union, right? And uh, the reason I bring this up is you know, for all of its uh, for all of its failings, the the STEM education we didn't call it STEM education at the time science, technology, engineering, and math uh, education. The public education in the communist bloc was actually really good, and that's still true today. That's that's still true even even in uh, Russia, Latvia, Belarus, Poland, all these former bloc countries. Their STEM education in school is very good. Their their kids in uh, public schools, middle school, pound for pound, they're two or three years ahead of ours in math, uh, in STEM in STEM technology. So you have a lot of people that are well-educated. They're not dumb by any stretch of the imagination. You know, in spite of uh, their challenges, the, you know, the Soviets made some remarkable scientific advancements. So they put a man in space and the nuclear power and these other things. And so you have uh, these people that are kind of stuck in areas of the world where there's a lack of economic opportunity. They have good education. Um, and they're really just, it, it's kind of a, a Robin Hood situation. As far as they're concerned, they're robbing the rich to give them the poor and the poor is themselves. Um, and a lot of them aren't necessarily poor anyway. So they, they kind of justify this, uh, in, in a way morally and ethically. And I should point out that what they're doing, uh, it is immoral and it is unethical, but it's not necessarily even illegal where they're doing it. Uh, most of the developed world, uh, Can Canada, the United, uh, Canada, the United States, Korea, Japan, Australia, uh, UK, Europe, they have legal prohibitions against hacking both inside and outside their borders. Um, myself as an American, I can't hack Americans. I can't hack Canadians. I can't, I can't even hack North Koreans. That's illegal. Um, not every country has laws like that. So let's say you set up a ransomware shop in, you know, Belarus or something like that, and you're targeting Australians, they're not going to do anything about it. The local authorities aren't going to do anything. Uh, they have bigger fish to fry. They have bigger problems, uh, and they're just not going to do anything about it. So, and they're also careful about picking targets that are not going to attract the wrong kind of attention. You know, you don't want to attract the attention of Interpol or the FBI or uh, the state security services, wherever you happen to be. So they, um, they know exactly what they're doing. Uh, this isn't what hackers look like. If you go into a search engine, you type in hackers and then click images. This is what, that's not what they look like. They Really, they look like me or you. You know what I mean? Um, 
a lot of these um, people uh, are are well educated. They're organized. They work in offices, and uh, the uh, these kind of caricatures that you see in the media are completely incorrect. And it drives me crazy because I think it twists people's perceptions of the threat that they're facing. You know what I mean? Um, imagine the people that are you know uh, that are attacking you have an education like I do. That's not good, and that's exactly what's going on. So, OK, so we're going to talk about some of the uh, the security concerns facing small to mid-sized businesses, SMBs. Uh, all organizations are being targeted by financially motivated organized crime actors. I tend to get ahead of myself in the slides, but I can't drive this point home enough. As I mentioned before, they, you know, they set themselves up in, in jurisdictions, right, where they can attack other jurisdictions with legal impunity. So there's almost no risk for them to do this. And these operations, they look, smell, act, taste, and operate exactly like a real business. They have engineers, they have project managers, they have financial targets, they have help desk people, they have square footage, they have all that stuff. Um, so they are organized. They are very organized. Do, uh, do not underestimate them. Uh, the gap between the number of breaches uh, seen by small and large organizations has become less pronounced is my, my headline here. And the reason is, is because they're just going after the low-hanging fruit. There's no risk. It's, it's just... Um, one one analogy, and I before we started recording, I was talking about this. When I was a kid back in the '80s, my dad would take us to these baseball games in Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in Southern Philly. And um, you know, Philly is uh, has its, its share of its share of issues. But you would come out after the game, and then a section of the parking lot, there would be a hundred cars that had their windows smashed. Right. So these guys would come in, and you would have one guy would smash the window, and then open the door, and then the next guy would come in with a bag, and then empty the car, and then they would hit a hundred of them, and then and then hightail it out of there. Right. It was a smash and grab attack. And these cyber warfare attacks are a lot like that. They're completely indiscriminate. You know what I mean? They they just get in, they get out, and they, they take your stuff, and then they go. And that's kind of all there is to it. But they're very organized. They're, they're good at what they're doing. So the driving factors here, 95% for the SMB is going to be financial. They're just they're just trying to rob you. 4% is going to be espionage. Uh, there's going to be rare cases where a small business is, and most of the time it's when they're subcontracting for a larger company. You're making some type of a part or subassembly, or you have some kind of information about a bigger company or some kind of proprietary information that they want or a trade secret, and they'll uh, break into that. And then some of the other things, ideology, grudge, hacktivists, hackers, script kiddies, stuff like that. And script kiddies... Uh, um, well, somebody that just downloads uh, pieces of malicious logic that they don't actually know how they operate, um, and then they deploy that stuff without even understanding how it actually works. Animated slides. I'm not a big fan of animation. I need to get rid of these. Uh, so bad actors work to find access into SMB systems through there's, there's a variety of means, and the, about half of them involve credentials, and. I've myself done penetration testing, white hat hacking, right? Which is where somebody pays me to break into their systems. Um, the last project that I did when I was doing that was we broke into a hedge fund and we stole the usernames and passwords of the entire staff. Um, but usernames and passwords are easy to steal. There's a variety of means to do it. You could uh, Technical means, social engineering, uh, you could use rainbow tables, brute force attacks, making phone calls, emails, uh, malicious logic, whatever. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, and I should also mention there are literally, there's uh, databases that have billions and billions of clear text passwords on the internet. So a sophisticated engineer could download all these things and then run some type of analytics on it and determine what are the, um, you know, 100 most common passwords and then start running brute force attacks. It's, it's easy. It's easy to do. Uh, and that's why multi-factor authentication is the first line of defense against that. And one of the things I love about MFA is, is it's, no, it's no longer expensive. It's no longer complicated. It's a little bit inconvenient. I'll give you that. But um, it's one extra step. It's completely worth it. You should have MFA, uh, multi-factor authentication, pretty much on everything that you could reasonably put it on and anything where it's missing. And uh, we're going to get into assessments later. These uh, Abidata is going to have uh, Abidata is going to have multiple uh, offerings for you. There's a bunch of different ways you could uh, you could do this. Uh, phishing, about 17 percent. And the reason why they do that, this is the law of average. Um, everybody gets junk mail, uh, in in and by junk mail I mean in your snail mail, right? Your your mailbox. So you get um, 
you know, offers for an oil change or windows or whatever it is. And the reason that market and the marketing firms send that stuff out. And the reason why marketing firms do that is because it works. This is the law of averages. If you send out 10,000 or a hundred thousand of these things, you know that you're going to get some reliable, uh, conversion rate, right? Just like marketing and the phishing email is exactly the same, uh, the same way. And if you send out 10 million or a hundred million of these things, and uh, last time I checked, I think something like 85% of the email that's traversing the globe on a daily basis is junk mail spam, uh, the overwhelming majority of it. So it's easy to do, it's cheap, it's really low risk. So it, it continues to be a pervasive problem and it's going to be a, a pervasive problem for the foreseeable future. The email protocols that we have, things like SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol, POP, uh, post office protocol. These things were designed in the 1970s. Uh, they were never intended to do the things that they're doing these days. So we're, you know, we'd have a lot, a lot of work to do. We're really, really just in, in defensive mode. Um, exploits, that's, uh, uh, you know, a piece of malicious logic, vi vi virus, worm, Trojan. Uh, as far as phishing goes, the solution for that is going to be security awareness training and then email filtering. And again, these are things you get from Abidata. And when I say email filtering, what I mean here is, um, let's say that Alice is sending an email to Bob, right? I don't want the email going directly from Alice's domain to Bob's domain. I want it going from Alice uh, to an intermediary warehouse in the middle where it, it's scanned and it's correlated and it's checked and they check the code and then they send it to Bob after that. And this is another product offering, again, that Abidate is going to have for you. There's a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, uh, there's going to be something that's going to fit your needs, but this one is really important. I don't want pieces of malicious logic arriving in your inbox to begin with at all uh, because it just creates more risk. Um, so uh, security awareness training, email filters, and then uh, exploits, m malicious logic. This is part of defense and death, but system patching, intrusion detection, SIEM, uh, EDR, MDR. There's a bunch of advanced protective technologies that can defend against exploits. So this is a kind of a walkthrough of a breach, right? Um, the first thing is cyber attack, bad actor access, investigation, data exfiltration, BCDR manipulation, product manipulation. So this is all a process, right? And if you're in business, you have processes for things and hackers, they have processes for things that they follow. They're gonna have standard operating procedures that they follow. So the first thing is gonna be the attack. That's a reconnaissance. They're finding, you know, they're finding the victims and then they are looking to exploit you somehow uh, and actually get in there, whether it's a piece of malicious logic or an email or social engineering or whatever it is. And after that, they get access. This is, at this point, they're looking to maintain persistent access. We call a toehold. We call this a toehold uh, or, you know, uh, putting a back door in your system so they can come and go as they please without you knowing about it. Um, once they get uh, persistent access, then they're going to start investigating. This is, and they're quiet during all this. They're not going to advertise their presence to you at all. And uh, during the investigation phase, excuse me for just a second, I apologize. Uh, so the next piece is going to be investigation. And this would be, um, imagine that you uh, break into an abandoned factory. You get in through some window or something like that. You leave a door ajar. So that's your your back door. It's your persistent access. And you find some gigantic factory. You're like a you know 16-year-old kid, you and your friends. You find some gigantic factory. What do you do? You're going to go explore the thing, right? We're going to see the basement. We're going to go up on the roof. I know this because back in the 80s, we did this kind of stuff as kids. But this is exactly what uh, the threat actors will do. Now they're going to explore. They're just going to look around. What's in here? Is there anything neat you know i mean maybe you'll find something that's really neat uh, maybe you'll find something you won't but they're gonna they're gonna go in there they're gonna explore every nook and cranny of your network and then kind of map things out and see what's there uh once they've done that sometimes they leave uh but if they leave they're gonna leave that back door in there anyway they're gonna leave that uh the persistent access in there because then they're gonna use you as a jumping off point to attack other people in order to cover their tracks so they're not gonna leave they're gonna stay there uh, the next piece is going to be data exfiltration. So they're going to find any data that they could that is important to you or that could get you in trouble or is going to make your customers angry or could put you in some kind of hot water, um, anything that they could monetize, and they're going to ex exfiltrate that. And really, they just exfiltrate everything as much as they can. Sometimes they target stuff. But they're going to exfiltrate all of it and then pick uh, pick through all of that later. So they've got they've got they've got their payload. Once they've exfiltrated the data, and they now they have customer lists. They might have finances. They might have trade secrets. They might have PI, uh, personally PII, PHI, protected health information, personally identifying information. Uh, it, it, there's all kinds of data that that they're interested in. 
Um, once they do this, then they're going to look at your backup schema, your uh, uh, your your backup your backup plans. BCDR refers to business continuity and disaster recovery. So they'll look at your backup systems, and most businesses have them, and they've been known to manipulate these things in ways that are imperceptible to even seasoned admins. So they'll change the backup so that it's backing up garbage like log files or something like that, right? And then the admins will go look or say, okay, well the backup ran. I have you know two gigabits of data. It's good. That's that's not good enough. You have to actually mount it and then look at it and then make sure that the data is correct. Uh, so this is a sleight of hand at this point, right? They have you, you know, looking at this where they're doing something over here. They're messing with your BCDR. Uh, the next thing might be production manipulation. They might intervene in. At, at this point, they're going to be start. This is when they start bringing the pain. They're going to start making your life difficult uh, because now now is coming the request. So. They're messing with they're messing with your production, and then you know one day you come in. This is when you see the skull and crossbones on your screen, and some kind of demand, or you get an email or something like that. Well, now they're advertising their presence. Now they're saying we're here, and you got to pay to get rid of us. And look on the left here. Average time of this is about 200 days. That's what we call dwell time. This d dwell time is absolutely critical. This is when bleeding starts, and we need to triage and then stop that bleeding right away. Now in the enterprise, uh, I came from enterprise. I'd you know, worked in places, we had all the security you could ever want. And for us, if there was a, a breach, dwell time would be very short. Now with the protective technologies that I'm gonna get into in a couple of minutes here, we could get that dwell time down to a couple of hours. Uh, and, you know, seven or eight years ago, this technology was not available to the small to mid-sized business at all. Um, some of these BCDR, or, um, um, EDR vendors like Sentinel One, if you called up Sentinel One seven or eight years ago and said, I want to buy your product, they'd say, okay, great. How many thousands of seats do you want? It was an enterprise product. So if you're General Electric or Boeing or something, you could get it. But um, but now these technologies are available to the SMB through part three or partnerships with, uh, with Abidata. So I have a slide here. Ransomware is a service, a production line of organized crime. This is how they scale. So let's say that you have some organization, again, it's in Eastern Europe or Asia or something like that, and they have some revenue number, you know, everybody wants to go, well, how do we double this or how do we triple it? Well, let's sell our ransomware as a kit. And it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like an Ikea kit, right? You get everything in there, including the little wrenches and the screws and the instructions, and then there's a phone number to call if you can't find something. Um, so then they sell it and now you have, you know, a hundred or a thousand or, you know, 2000 other people that are out using your ransomware kit to rob people. And what they're doing is they're, they're getting back. It's like franchising, right? So it's they're You're paying franchise fees to do this. Um, so they're very sophisticated in terms of their business tactics and they almost there, a lot of what they do, it looks, acts, smells and tastes exactly like a, what a real business does. Uh, so, so what they're doing again is immoral and, uh, and unethical, but not necessarily illegal where they happen to be doing it. Paying the ransom uh, rarely works. An average 65% of data is restored after paying the ransom. This statistic comes from Sophos. I've seen it higher. Um, I've seen it lower. I think it's actually a little bit higher than this. Uh, I've seen this statistic coming from different uh, uh, from different reports. And in my experience, these threat actors, they tend to be very diligent about protecting their business model. And what protecting their business model means is that if you pay the ransom, that they have to give you what they're promising you. Otherwise, people are not going to pay because then they become disreputable, so to speak. Right. Um, so if you don't if they don't give you back your data, then people are not going to pay. Their business model dries up. So I've heard cases, remember what I had mentioned earlier, they, they'll they'll hire interns, right? So you get some chipper 22-year-old on the phone trying to help you decrypt your data, and that's their job, and they're actually happy to do it. You know what I mean? Um, they don't even think it, they don't even think it's wrong. And I've 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 read cases about them being like enthusiastic and helpful, you know what I mean? Helping pe helping victims get their data back. Uh, boy, these numbers keep going up. I have, uh, I'm going to get in the next slide here, but it, it's not just, these numbers are, are, are atrocious and they're, they're bringing the pain on purpose. Uh, it, it about doubled from 2020 to 2021 and it's gone, gone up even more since then, but these numbers are high. Most small businesses cannot afford this kind of money, which is why so many small businesses go out of business when these ransomware attacks happen. Uh, bad ones could put you out of business just like a building fire or a flood. The ransom, is sh it, that's just a start. Uh, I, I, I wish that um, you know the media and us as uh, cybersecurity actors would 
um, do a better job of helping people understand that. But that's why we're doing this. But the ransomware payment isn't even usually the biggest cost. That's part of it. The disruption and downtime, if you're not able to operate and they do this on purpose, they will you know, shut your operations down. If you have ERP enterprise resource planning or um, you know, e-commerce or something, they'll shut that stuff off to get you to pay. Uh, so you're you're in. So the first thing that's happening is they're hemorrhaging cash. You know, two three weeks worth of cash flow, four weeks worth of cash flow, whatever. Sometimes more. How many businesses could afford to have that kind of disruption in cash flow? Forensics and recovery, high five figures or more. So now, um, you have to find five or ten people like me, fly them to you to go clean this up, right? And that's it's Saturday night or whatever. You know, this is the costs are outrageous. This is five figures, a pile of money um, for for forensics. Uh, data loss. Don't expect all the data to be recovered if you pay. A lot of times it is. Many times it isn't. Um, so losing the data costs money. There's all kinds of legal problems with this. Privacy violations, negligence, service downtime. You could get sued. The customers get mad. Reputation loss. It does massive reputation damage. You've probably all seen this in the news. When you have these uh, big companies, these publicly traded ones get hit, uh, it kills their market cap. They'll tank their market cap by a couple of million dollars overnight. I almost wonder if there's insider trading going on around that. Ins insider trading. It stands to reason that there would be, you know. Um, infrastructure and before and after the ransomware hit. In in highly advanced environments, we would nuke and pave everything. We'd wipe it all. We'd wipe it. We'd, we'd uh, just throw the hard drives out, throw the RAM out, rebuild everything. Small businesses can't afford to do that stuff. Um, but it's, it's, the costs on this are massive, and they are, you know, making this as painful as possible. Uh, we're only human. A person is involved at the center of most security events. 82% of breaches involve from uh, result from human elements. And I'd mentioned earlier that I've done penetration testing or white hat hacking, and I would say that this, from my empirical perspective, that this is about true. Uh, because what happens is we do reconnaissance and the first thing we look for are internet connected systems. One of the first things we look for are things that are exposed to the internet. Um, we find everything that's exposed to the internet and then we scan that and then look for holes. And we find that normally the doors and the windows are locked. Okay, fair enough. You know what I mean? That's where your biggest risk is. So <clears throat> hackers are lazy just like everybody else. So they're going to take the path of least resistance. So if you can't get through the systems, the next thing you're going to do is start uh, uh, social engineering. Um, in other words, tricking humans into making bad decisions that benefit uh, that benefit myself as a threat actor. So most of the breaches they involve a human at some point, tricking a human into getting something that allows me to get into that allows us to get into the systems. Sixty six percent of breaches involve phishing or stolen credentials. I, I mentioned earlier, stealing usernames and passwords is easy to do, which is why defense in depth and multi factor authentication, email filtering and, and uh, EDR and MDR, this defense in depth, all these things are, are, are necessary. 2.9% of employees may click on phishing emails. It's more like will click on phishing emails. This is a pretty, this number is pretty consistent. And again, it goes back to my analogy with uh, getting junk mail. They do that. Marketing firms do that because it works. It's a law of averages. And as long as spam is cheap and easy and low risk to do, it's going to continue to be a problem. We're going to continue to fight that. Um, uh, SMBs can significantly reduce their attack surface by focusing on controls. And I, uh, I get ahead of myself in the slides, but email filters, I'd mentioned that. Practice good password hygiene. Um, I think everybody knows what that means. When I talk about password hygiene these days, I feel like I'm telling people to brush their teeth and wash their hands. I think um, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, everybody has kids, right? The kid brush their teeth. Well, they said they did. <laughs> I don't know. You know, so you can only, you can only uh, beat somebody over the head so much over this stuff. Uh, use multi-factor authentication uh, everywhere you can. But these these three things, let's say you don't know today. You, you don't know where you're at. Um, I, I don't know. Doing these three things today, and these these things are not really expensive. They're not complicated. They're not difficult. Will dramatically reduce your um, uh, the probability and the impact of an, uh, an attack hitting you. And this is, you've all heard the joke about, you know, if a bunch of people are running from a bear, you don't have to be the fastest person. You just have to not be the slowest one. And um, and the same thing is true here, right? This is just being faster than 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 somebody else, but this works, and I really recommend this. This will protect you. Get with Abidate on these things, and they can help you with this uh, easily. Uh, current attack uh, vectors for ransomware: email, desktop sharing, software, web applications. 
Um, 30% of ransomware incidents involve remote desktop sharing software. This is continues to be a pain point for me. When I ran assessments and I did penetration testing, we frequently found uh, RDP exposed to the internet remote desktop protocol. And remote desktop protocol, that's when you put a uh, command into Windows and then, you know, an IP address, you access a remote system that pops the desktop up and then you could log into it. Um, and there are use cases for doing this. There's operational use cases as small businesses do this a lot. And if you have to do it, okay. Um, then there's a bunch of different things that we could do to mitigate that risk. Um, it's like if you're gonna, you know, ride a motorcycle, right? What do you do? You, you know, put on boots and you put on pants and you put on a jacket, motorcycle helmet, and all that stuff. Yeah, we could we could make it much safer. You know, what I mean, um, you still might crash, but <laughs> um, so, uh, but there are use cases for exposing RDP to the internet, and uh, if we have to do that, then we could put in, uh, we could use VPN, we could use multi-factor authentication. Uh, we could use EDR, MDR. There's a bunch of technologies that we could use to mitigate that risk if you um, if you have to uh, run RDP or ride a motorcycle, as I mentioned. 30, 35% of ransomware incidents involve the use of uh, email with links to droppers or attachments. That's It's about a third. Uh, that remains true. I already covered that point. That's going to continue to be a problem for the foreseeable future. Um, web applications remain a threat. This is when you go to some malicious website. The browsers and the antivirus have kind of gotten ahead of this problem. It's still a problem, but we don't see it uh, as much where simply visiting a website infects your computer. So that, that's kind of the scary stuff, right? These, these are the threats that are facing you. And it, it's not that I want to scare people or anything like that, but the reality of what's going on is kind of scary. And we're trying to protect small businesses. Um, small businesses are the backbone of our economies. Um, and we don't want them getting attacked and then going out of business. So we're going to talk about SIEM and MDR. These are advanced protective technologies. And um, this stuff was available in enterprise space 15, 18 years ago. And it's only within the last couple of years that we've been able to bring this kind of technology to small to mid-sized businesses at costs that are affordable without massive disruptions to operations. These were enterprise tools. So what is a SIEM and why do we need it? SIEM is security information and event management. All the machines that are on your network, an information system, a modern information system operates 24-7, 365, and your uh, computer servers, routers, switches, IoT, uh, cameras, whatever it is, all this stuff generates, pretty much anything that has an IP address generates log files, most of it anyway, um, especially servers and workstations. And... Uh, in a poorly controlled environment, these logs are kind of, they just go off into the ether and, and they're not investigated. In the enterprise, we investigate those. But uh, so we need to ingest these log files into uh, into a seam so we can determine what's, go what's going on. And a, a typical information system will generate hundreds of thousands of event logs per day. And it's just impossible for a human to go through these things. And out of those hundreds of thousands of logs, uh, very rarely is there going to be something that needs the attention of a human. But when we do find something that needs the attention of a human, we need to know that right now. Uh, for example, let's say that a threat actor breaks in and they create, uh, you know, a domain admin account at two o'clock in the morning on Christmas, right? That's something you need to know about. We need to notify a human about that. And a seam could pick something like that up and then send out, send out an alert. And there's other reasons besides security for seam auditing and compliance requirements. We're finding a lot of cybersecurity insurance carriers are now, are now requiring SIEM. Full visibility of everything happening in the network dramatically decreases the time it takes to identify threats. Remember that 200 day uh, dwell time I was talking about before? SIEM is one of those technologies where it take that 200 days and we collapse it down to like a day or two and that really matters. Uh, detailed forensics analysis in the event of major security breaches. So um, sometimes they get in and one of the first things they do is they try to cover up their tracks, right? They're picking up the broken glass, wiping away the fingerprints, cleaning up the blood, so to speak. Uh, but when you have seen, we take these logs and then we offload them into a cloud, into the cloud where they're kept in salt, cold storage so that we do investigation. It doesn't matter what the threat actors do. We have copies of this stuff already. Um, so they can't, they can't erase it. And that's we're not letting them erase uh, the evidence. This is what a typical solution stack looks for defense in depth and defense in depth. Think of a medieval castle, right? You, you do your analysis, you put your, your crown jewels go in the highest room of the highest tower, right? Like in Trek. Uh, and you have a moat and you have a drawbridge and you have the high walls and you have the turrets and you have the archers and you have knights, you have all these things. So the idea with a medieval castle is that if one of the layers of defense fails, if they get over the moat and then through the drawbridge, um, you know, now they're at the castle, even if they get over the castle walls, they're still not getting to the crown jewels. They got a ways to go. That's defense in depth. Defense in depth is designed so that even if one or more layers fails, that the crown jewels remain safe. Um, so... 
Uh, all these, so MDR, uh, that's managed detection and response, DNS and web filtering, security and awareness training, access management, SEAM and SOC, business continuity and disaster recovery. This is what defense in depth looks like. This is what a layered defense um, looks like to protect those ground jewels. And I'm going to get into an assessment uh, in the last part of the presentation. And these are all things that, again, that Abidata can help you with. And here, here's kind of the the problem with SEAM. And now people like me, I'm an, uh, an engineer, you know, well, SEAM is a critical protective and detective technology, critical protective and detective technology. We love it. Um, but SEAM is kind of an abstract concept and it's hard to explain what it does uh, in, in non-technical terms. And I have an entire half an hour long slideshow just on that, explaining what SEAM is to the butcher, the baker and the candlestick makers, what I call it, right? Um, but and then and then uh, the CFO is the decision maker, the person that has to actually pay for this. So what does this even do? I don't I don't understand this because it's difficult. And then engineer says, well, it's a critical protective detective technology. And then the, the users, it doesn't affect the users. It doesn't it doesn't make your computer faster. It doesn't make it slower. There's no blinking lights. It doesn't do any of that. So the users they just they just don't care. So even though people really need seem, sometimes it, it could be hard to um, explain the value proposition because it's an abstract technology. Uh, so how a SIEM works, a SIEM works by ingesting logs from various uh, points on your network. Um, work from home employees, cloud integrations, workstations, and servers. Uh, if you have a decent sized network, uh, Abidata can send you a small sensor to plug into your network, and then it's going to ingest that data, and then it's going to send it into Perch, and it's going to uh, analyze all this data for you. Um, it sends all these things into our secure cloud instance where it's it's correlated and aggregated, and then the alerts happen. So SIEM and NDR, SIEM and EDR, SIEM, SIEM is a detective technology primarily. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like a smoke detector, right? All it's going to do is alert you that there's smoke. It doesn't actually do anything about it. Um, but EDR is more like sprinklers. Um, it, it'll actually put a fire out. EDR and MDR can actually put a fire out. So um, EDR and MDR. Well, this is a slide. I, I'm a I'm a car nerd. I love my car slides. Um, so traditional antivirus versus EDR and MDR. Old school antivirus, it's, it's a simple kind of a pattern matching technology. Um, and it's just not very sophisticated. And I would compare old school antivirus to um, an old car that just has crumple zones and seat belts. And incidentally, this debt Mercedes, that that's mine. I bought it for 850 bucks. It's a, it's a 1983 Mercedes Benz S class. It was the safest thing you could get at the time, but that's, that's, that's your safety seat belts and crumple zones. That's all you get. And it was the safest thing you get at the time. Now the car on the right, um, that's my Buick. My, my kids named it Bob for boring old Buick. Um, but if, uh, you know, if you're driving Bob and you're not paying attention and then a little kid runs out in front of you, Bob will stop himself. Right. You don't have to do anything. And this is kind of the difference between old school antivirus and EDR, MDR. Um, EDR and uh, MDR can identify, protect, detect, respond and recover. I, I probably everybody listening here is at one point. Um, who, who's ever deleted a column out of Excel or deleted uh, a, a paragraph out of Word? Remember in the old days, you're hitting Control S every every five seconds. You're writing a paper. You don't have to do that anymore. If you delete something, just click Undo. Poof, it comes back. Right, you make a mistake. Poof, it comes back. EDR and MDR, they have an Undo feature built into them. So even if the threat actor gets a toehold and they start manipulating the system, EDR and MDR will track that. And if they're making changes to the registry or making changes to permissions or installing stuff, EDR and MDR could actually uh, stop that in real time and then undo it. These technologies are not even close. So regular antivirus and EDR, MDR, they're not even close. <clears throat> Remember WannaCry? That thing was nasty. It was 2017. Um, WannaCry, the story that was um, given to the public is that Eternal Blue was a piece of malicious logic that was built by the NSA. And the public and the story is that it somehow leaked from the NSA. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Um, but anyways, it was a piece of nation state grades military weapons grade malicious logic, eternal blue, nasty thing. Uh, North Korea got a hold of it and then they wrapped it in a worm. And then a worm is something that can propagate from system to system without human intervention, right? It propagates like a, like a, a disease in a crowded theater, right? Um, and then they attached a crypto locker function to this thing. And, you know, the irony of this is that it could have made it a, 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 a massive ton of loot, but the North Koreans are, I guess, they're terrible capitalists, and it didn't make them a ton of money, but it sure did a lot of damage, and it made a big mess. So think about this. A piece of malicious logic built by the National Security Agency, the American National Security Agency, is rolling these systems. They dumped it in Europe first. And all of the endpoints that had antivirus, they were just wrecked by this. They were completely wrecked by it. Uh, but machines that had Sentinel-1... 
even though this is a zero day exploit, never be seen, uh, never before seen in the wild, um, weapons grade, nation state weapons grade, Sentinel-1 saw this and it crushed it day one, even though it had never seen it before ever because it saw what it was doing on the systems and then it crushed it. This is how advanced EDR and MDR over antivirus. Uh, I, it, it's hard to even to even try to uh, drive home how different they are. Um, I got ahead of myself. Traditional uh, AV versus EDR, MDR. I uh, already covered this. I uh, already covered that. I talk a lot to get ahead of myself. Um, this is this is kind of an engineering slide. This comes from Sentinel One, but these are some of the things that EDR and MDR do: real-time file analysis. It could actually analyze the code. It actually analyze the payload. And one of the differences, one of the big differences between uh, antivirus and EDR MDR is antivirus is a pattern matching technology. And uh, EDR has pattern matching, but also has pattern recognition. So if it looks like a duck, acts like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. It's going to, you know, it's going to do something about it. Antivirus can't do that. So it can actually analyze the code, remediate, kill, and quarantine, one click cleanup. Remember, I mentioned the undo feature before. So even if it does get past the defenses, which most of the time it won't, it'll start tracking what it's doing, uh, you know, making changes to the registry, sending out weird TCP IP traffic, doing something in PowerShell. It could actually undo those things. It'll disconnect the machine from the network virtually so it can't send any traffic and the only people that can get into it are SOC operators. Uh, has local firewall control, anti-tamper capabilities. It's highly sophisticated stuff. Doing on time here, okay. So um, with all that said, now I'm gonna talk about security and risk assessments. and. Well, security and risk assessments are important because you don't know what you don't know, right? That's what you need experts for. And everybody relies on experts for something, right? Whether it's, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, or a mechanic, or a plumber, or what, whatever it is. Um, in this case, we're talking about a cybersecurity practitioner like myself and like Abadeta. But um, look at this. You, um, see anything wrong here? This looks unremarkable, right? It's a service entrance cable that you would see on most ha any house, really, uh, in the United States or Canada. But there's actually something wrong with this. Um, the one, on, the one on the right there, it has no drip loop. So when the cable, the aerial up at the top, if that gets wet, it's going to run down into that weatherhead and short that thing out. It's supposed to have a drip loop on it. Now, the one on the left, that has a drip loop. So when those wires get wet, the rain will run down to the bottom of the wire so it can't run up into the up into that weatherhead. So one of these is right and one of these is wrong. And how did I find, this is my house, by the way. That picture was taken, I think, in 2005 when I bought it, uh, when I had uh, when I had an assessment done in the house. I bought, you know, bought a 260 year old house. Of course, you're gonna have an expert come look at it. Um, so when you have an assessment, it's like this. When you have an assessment with Abadata, you're gonna get pages of things. Well, I didn't know this. This is not my core competency. You just don't know what you don't know. So you have sort of these epiphanies about things that you need to do and not do that they'll explain to you. Uh, these are the components of a well-designed cybersecurity solution for your business, and there's a bunch of them. And, and in places like ConnectWise or Abadata or places where I worked, we have all of these things. Uh, Multi-factor authentication, encryption, firewall, backup, dark web research, semen log management, security awareness, training, passwords, blah, 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 right? Um, but all that stuff starts somewhere, right? The, uh, the old saying goes, uh, Confucius said that uh, the journey of a million miles begins with the first step. Um, my grandfather was a building, uh, a, a building contractor, and he would say, well, you have to get up on the roof and pound the first nail, don't you? And uh, I don't know if grandpa ever read Confucius, but he sounded like him. Uh, but the first step on your cybersecurity journey, uh, journey is going to be the security assessment. We need to start somewhere. And this is something that Abadata can help you with. And I mentioned in the previous slide, well, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and this is why why, you, why you're bringing experts to have an assessment. So um, I we love our analogies. I love analogies. I like my car analogies and house analogies. And um, so we're going to compare a security assessment to doing a security assessment on your home or your apartment. Um, this is... I'm missing an animation here. No, I'll have to fix that. <laughs> um, but let's say we're going to do an assessment on your house, right? The, well, the first thing you want to do is identify what is it that we need to protect? What are your crown jewels? It's going to be your loved ones, your loved ones, your family, your pets, wife, kids, grandma, grandpa, uh, pets, uh, maybe your collectibles, grandpa's watch, grandma's ring, documents and val valuables, diplomas, uh, electronics and computers. I mean, these things are like a thousand, a thousand dollars. I would, if my house was burning, I would probably grab my my iPhone and my laptop and uh, you know some other things and try and get out of the house with it. So once we've identified what it is that we need uh, that we want to protect, we're going to figure out ways to protect that in a house, doors and windows, locks, uh, education, yard signs. 
and, and yard signs, incidentally, that, that's what we call it. That's a deterrent control, by the way. Let's hypothetically say that you have um, two houses next to each other, and they, they're, you know, nice houses, BMW in the driveway, nice big house. Um, the lights are out. You're casing them out. One has a yard sign. One doesn't. There's a chance that uh, the threat actor is going to pick the one that doesn't have the yard sign because it's uh, it's a deterrent control. Um, another example of a deterrent control might be if you go into a casino and you see zillions of cameras that are in the in the um, uh, ceilings. Most of them are going to be real, but some of them are going to be not real. It's a cost savings measure and it deters people. So if only you know if only 40 percent or some percentage of those are, are real, people are going to you know behave. It's a deterrent. Uh, once we've done that, we need to detect an incident. How could we detect an incident? Alarms, motion sensor, doorbell cameras, neighborhood watch, uh, respond. Um, once we determine that something's going on, we need to respond to it. Dog. And, uh, you know, a dog incidentally is, um, that's, uh, as with technology and you're, you'll see what we're leading up to here in a minute. You could probably smell another analogy brewing. Um, but a dog is something that can protect, detect and respond. Right. And, uh, technologies like that too. There's, uh, protective technology that could do different things. It could protect, detect, and respond, or it might just detect and respond, or it might identify and protect. It's not just one, it's not just a one for one thing. Uh, respond, uh, you might need to call our insurance company, call, uh, call the police. Um, you know, a funny thing, I live in a rural farming community. We don't even have a police department here. I have to call the state police. Uh, there's no crime here though. Uh, a baseball bat, some type of weapon. Uh, and the last piece here is is recover. But in this case, I'm talking about cybersecurity, not uh, not necessarily your house, right? Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And you might have seen that in my earlier slide in the picture with with my with the Buick. I had the, those colors there uh, with the red car. But in this case, we're actually talking about the NIST cybersecurity framework. And the NIST cybersecurity framework has these five uh, five functions: identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Uh, and after this, there are 21 families, and then there's 108 controls, and those 108 controls, those all come out of uh, a publication called NIST 800-53, and that's about 500 pages. So all of this stuff is, it's very mature, it's very methodical. So um, these assessments and the protective technologies and things that Abidate is providing for you, these ultimately flow down from the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, uh, <clears throat> And uh, well, uh, under recover here, I have cyber incident response plan, backup systems, insurance, emergency equipment. Of course, in this case, I'm actually referring to recovering from a cyber uh, cyber attack, not a home attack. Uh, and now we have some time for Q&A. I think it came in just over about two minutes there. Um, and uh, Dave, did you have something to add about the uh, the assessments in closing or Jeff or um, Lindy? Yeah, I'll I'll take that. So, um, Jason, thank you. A uh, lot of great information in there. And, you know, out to our customers, um, you've heard a lot of this already. Um, I know we've been doing risk assessments with you guys and, and going through that and talking about that. Um, it's nice to see it reinforced again here. Um, Jason's had a lot of experience out in the world and uh, <clears throat> this stuff is real, right? It happens all the time. Um, so we're working to keep you guys safe. Um, I think most everyone on here has already had a risk assessment done. Um, if you guys haven't had a risk assessment done, uh, we'll reach out to you. Um, it's something that we're going to keep working on to, uh, you know, keep bringing you guys all up to snuff, um, keep you protected. Um, is there any questions on anything we went over? Yeah, feel free just to unmute and, and give your question, or you can type it in the q and You know, I think one of the things when it comes to risk assessments as well, is is that it gives you a chance to see how you're progressing against the third party industry standard tool um, you know every msp that you you come up against i think they have their own ways of doing things and you, know, you gotta have a certain firewall or whatever but i think it really becomes important to measure yourself against a standard and that's why we we we, we what we did is we uh addressed that by accepting a standard and that was as jason indicated the NIST standard um it's by far and away the one of the most popular standards out there it's the national institute of standards and uh, uh i.e the federal government uh, has come up with this and um i really think it's one of those things that uh really helps set apart your own security is having that standard in there so uh Feel free to, if anybody's got a question, feel free to jump in. Um, it, this is something that 
really affects every one of us. Um, even our own company, we heavily invest in security, uh, much more so than even our customers. Um, y- you have to keep you have to keep your environment secure today. And I'll, and I'll take the standards thing um, just one step further. One standard that people are going to be familiar with empirically is going to be the Canadian Electrical Code, right? And in, in, in the United States, we have the National Electric Code. And you go into any building, whether it's commercial or whether it's residential, and then you have your outlet. Your outlets are six feet apart and they're 18 inches above finished floor and they're 15 amp and they're 20 amp. And then you have 100 amp service, 200 amp service, and it's all very standardized, right, for fire life safety. And uh, these electrical code, if you ever read the National Electric Code or the Canadian Electrical Code, the, the thing is like uh, five, six hundred pages. You know, when I worked for the White House, I read that entire thing two or three times. Uh, but the um, the NIST standard is kind of like that. It standardizes things for cybersecurity, just as the Canadian Electrical Code um, keeps your home or business safe uh, from electrical fires or from people getting electrocuted. Yeah. Yeah, we're not, nobody's, we're not making any of this up at all. <laughs> There's there's nothing ad hoc about it. No, and and like it, it, one of the things that's always important to people is is the cost, and uh, uh, this is what helps you balance and choose and choose correctly. Yeah, guys, and if uh, you know no one wants to have a question in front of everyone, I totally get that. Um, you all have my email address um, and our phone number. So, you know, if after the call you'd like to, you know, ask a question or request something, just absolutely let me know and, uh, you know, I'll touch base with you guys. So, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Hopefully um, I'll get up there for a live event with uh, with you guys at some point when it's warm. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's coming. Um, We're almost there. <laughs> I'm, they're, they're sending, I'm doing an event in Hawaii in uh, in two weeks. I'm at a golf resort. I'm kind of kind of excited about that. That'll be nice. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So, yeah. Well, we got Robin, so we'll we'll settle for that for the moment. So, well, I want to thank everyone for attending today. And uh, like Jeff said, uh, we'll be following up, uh, and uh, I'll look forward to speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.